Hey guys, and welcome to another walk-in Wednesday. This gun did actually walk in. No, it does not have legs, uh, but the gentleman who owned this gun previously is local, and so he drove over, brought me several guns, uh, all very nice guns, and this paratrooper. Now this paratrooper, uh, of course, this is a Japanese paratrooper. One of the ways to tell right away that something is Japanese uh, is because they had the straight bolt. Uh, the German K98s had a, a curved bolt uh, in World War II anyway. Again, the Japanese guns are not something that I have a lot of expertise on, but I have to bring them to you, especially this one. Let's look at, uh, uh, well, we'll get close-ups in the second half of the video. Uh, but if you look at this gun, you can see the wood is beautiful. The, the uh, uh, metal still has beautiful blue on it. Uh, we'll take close-ups later, but you can see that it has an intact mum and uh, basically everything is intact other than a few details, which again, I'll go over. Uh, but what makes this uh, most important is uh, this is a Type 99 uh, rifle, uh, Type 99, which the Japanese came out with in 1938. They also realized they needed a paratrooper gun because armies around the world were beginning to uh, build up paratroopers as part of their uh, attack strategy. The Japanese, of course, wanted to keep up with the latest innovations uh, so they experimented with three paratrooper rifles. The first two didn't work out so well. Second half of the video, I'll go over that. I'll show you all three types, but this is a Type 2. It's very confusing because it's actually the third model, but it's a Type 2. We'll explain that later. Um, and the way that it attaches is right here. Basically, it's a Type 99. They just cut it in half and put a, uh, a connector here. Uh, if I pull this bolt out, it'll come apart. I'm going to show that to you in the second half of the video. I just wanted you to see this rifle uh, first and foremost. A Type 99 that has been cut in half. The caliber is 7.7, .7, which is an upgrade uh, from the Type 38. Um, and uh, I did a, a video about the sniper rifles, the Type 38, the Type 99. The Type 38 was a 6.5 caliber, which was a kind of a light load and uh, poorer penetration on the battlefield. Uh, this, however, was their upgrade, uh, 1938. Uh, this model was produced in 1942. So, uh, having said 1942, let me just point out, I'm going to call 1942 uh, the year of the paratrooper because there were several innovations in 1942, and as I'm reading the history of it, I, I, I really found it ironic. If you, if you know German paratroopers, uh, they, of course, uh, for, as far as a fold-up uh, gun, they could use the MP40, but the Luftwaffe made a special order of FG42s in 1942 just for the paratroopers. Many of you have seen videos on the FG42, one of the most popular machine guns in the world for collectors, um, and I have, I have tried to buy them on auction, and they go well over $100,000. So again, this was made for the Luftwaffe according to their design specifications. And the Luftwaffe had the paratroopers under, under their command, as opposed to the United States Army um, and the earliest M1 carbine paratrooper rifles that I have sold were in 1942. So uh, again, in this case, the Army has paratroopers uh, within their ranks and they used uh, this gun in particular, which is often known as a paratrooper carbine or the M1A1, uh, and this has a folding stock. Uh, we have sold quite a number of these. Again, very popular with collectors. Uh, the last video I did, by the way, I talked about Navy and, you know, Navy uh, items are more expensive, more desirable. And then the most desirable is Special Forces, and paratroopers would fall under that. So. The paratrooper carbine, uh, certainly the FG-42, uh, all being developed in 1942. And then the Japanese, this is a, um, a Type 99, but it was made in, in 1942 because the Japanese um, used paratroopers for the first time in 1942 when they invaded the island of Sumatra. Interestingly, the Japanese were actually trained by the Germans. They were allies at the time, and the Germans were using paratroopers. Uh, they used paratroopers for uh, secret missions, rescue missions. I, I think one of the famous rescue missions was uh, when they went in and rescued uh, Mussolini, uh, in, who was being held captive in Italy. Uh, a lot of clandestine operations. Uh, whereas the United States and Japan tended to use paratroopers for 
coastal invasions, meaning the coasts were all heavily fortified. And so one way around that was to drop paratroopers behind the enemy lines. Of course, we all know the most uh, famous example in the United States was on D-Day when the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne divisions were parachuted uh, behind enemy lines to disrupt uh, the defenses behind the lines. In uh, the Battle of uh, Sumatra, the Japanese used that tactic. The, the uh, ports were all heavily fortified. And, and uh, what the Japanese did is they dropped uh, paratroopers behind the enemy lines. Their mission was to blow up oil uh, storage tanks, uh, to blow up munitions, uh, but most importantly, to take over the airport so that um, the Allied armies could not use uh, air cover. That all happened in early 1942, and if you look at a, the map of Sumatra, actually when I heard about the Battle of Sumatra as the first place the Japanese used paratroopers, I was thinking of a cup of coffee because Sumatra uh, is one of my favorite roasts, and Java, which is right next door, um, I assume now that they grow a lot of coffee there, but at the time it had some of the largest oil wells. It was part of the Dutch East Indies, uh, and they produced rubber, and oil, and they also had oil refineries to make gasoline, all things that the Japanese needed for their war effort. So right after their victory in Singapore, which was a huge victory for them over the British, they invaded Sumatra using paratroopers and then um, naval assault forces, and, and then eventually took over all of Java. Now I mentioned before that the paratroopers were under the Luftwaffe in Germany, the uh, paratroopers were under the army in the United States. Interestingly, paratroopers were actually, most of the paratrooper units, there were three major paratrooper units, were actually under the command of the Navy. So the Navy used them for the invasion of islands and coastal regions. I mentioned there were three units of paratroopers, um, and let's talk a little bit about the numbers. From what I could reach, and, and some of this is pretty sketchy because uh, you read different sources and they say completely different things. I'm trying to figure out how many paratroopers rifles were made. Um, there were actually, of the three units, they were all under a thousand paratroopers. So the number that went into Sumatra was only about 350, 360 uh, paratroopers that went in. But within each unit, there was about 800 paratroopers. So that tells me there were only a few thousand of these made. Uh, when we talk about the other variations, there was only a couple hundred because they're experimental and they basically rejected the design. Once they landed on this design, and basically it's just the design of how to take this apart, uh, once they landed on this design, they only made a few thousand. Oh, and one more thing I almost forgot. I, I thought it was an interesting antidote. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, three types uh, next, but one interesting antidote. So I mentioned that the Japanese were trained by the Germans, and when the Germans invaded Crete, uh, they used paratroopers, again, in the uh, interior of the island to disrupt the forces as the coastal uh, assault uh, started. Uh, but what, one thing that they made a mistake on was uh, th their model was to drop the men and all they carried was a sidearm, a pistol, and maybe some hand grenades and a dagger. Um, and they dropped the equipment separately. In canisters, they would drop it separately. And in the island of Crete, uh, unfortunately, uh, the equipment was dropped several miles from where the troops were dropped, and uh, of course by accident. And so then they had to... Uh, trudge across enemy territory with only a sidearm. So um, having trained the Japanese, they made the exact same mistake in 1942 when they parachuted into Sumatra. And of course the equipment is, was in one uh, location and they were dropped in another location. I actually have a video of a paratrooper. Uh, he's running across a field trying to get to the canisters. Uh, it wasn't a huge disaster, but it did cost them uh, some lives. And you can see this, uh, this paratrooper in particular, all they're holding is a, uh, looks like a, a little samurai sword. Um, so good luck with that. But of course they quickly then made it to their uh, equipment and went on to win the battle. So now let's just jump into this paratrooper uh, rifle uh, made by the Japanese and the three variations. Okay, it's a little bit confusing. If you're confused, don't feel bad because it took me a while and I'm still not sure I get it. Um, in a couple of videos, uh, the first variation is called the Type 100, but if you Google Type 100, it's actually a Japanese submachine gun. 
Ian makes the correction and says this, this first model is called the Type 100, but it's actually the Type 0 or 00. zero. And um, this was first made in 1940, so it is considered Type 0. At least that makes sense to me. Zero being the, uh, it's related to the Japanese calendar, but 1940 was Type 0. So the Type 0 is a Type 99, which has been cut in half, just like the one I'm showing here. Um, but it used interrupted threads and connected in this way. Uh, Ian actually does a great job, and Ian uh, McCullum from Forgotten Weapons does a great job demonstrating how this is attached. Then we have this spring-loaded plunger latch here. This is connected to a round steel peg inside, uh, about a quarter inch in diameter. So what I do to disassemble the rifle is pull this back to disengage it, rotate 60 degrees, and wiggle it loose. There we go. So you can obviously see our interrupted threads here. Inside the back half of the gun, you can see we've got those interrupted threads cut into the receiver here. And there is our locking pin. When I pull this latch back, that retracts. So the, the threads are what actually lock the two sections together and are precisely fitted. This peg just prevents the gun, the front half, from rotating on the back half so that it can't come loose. Now there is another cool feature to this. Um, you know, even if you've got two pieces that come apart like this, you've still got this bolt handle sticking out the side. The uh, observant among you will have already noticed that this bolt handle looks rather odd. The reason for that is that this bolt handle actually is threaded and comes off. Now originally you can see that this is two pieces right here. This would have been a spring tensioned pair of little teeth so that the bolt handle would have kind of snapped in place and been held tight in the bolt itself. Those have been bent together and they no longer provide any tension. But this base is still threaded. And we have this threaded stub that was added to the bolt handle. So they obviously, they cut off the original bolt, milled it round, threaded the inside, and then fabricated new bolt handles. There is a little uh, knurled or, or uh, striped groove here to give you a little bit of traction on it. And that fits right on there and threads on. Now, the later, the other types of paratroop rifles, most notably the Type II that was ultimately adopted, does not have this feature. And while I have not seen any documentation explaining why, it seems pretty clear to me that this is just asking for a lot of guys to accidentally lose their bolt handle and then end up with a gun that is extremely difficult to operate. So then the Type I, so the Type Zero, Type I, is actually a, a, a Model 38, which was, again, it's a Model 38 carbine, which is a shorter rifle. The, the, actually, the Model 38 was one of the longest rifles in the theater, which is uh, somewhat interesting in that the Japanese, uh, the average soldier was only five, five foot four. Um, so they made this carbine, which is a smaller uh, version, and they, they basically cut it, cut it in half right at the stock and folded it over. That's uh, the Type 1 design, and you can see here where Ian demonstrates how this rifle folds in two. So when you are going into battle, or when you're going to jump, what you would do is this, you can fold the stock up alongside the barrel of the rifle. And this makes it nice and compact to throw in a leg bag or, or otherwise carry with you on a paratroop drop. Having watched that, it really reminds me of the folding stock on the uh, M1A1 uh, from the American model, which just seems to make so much more sense. Uh, but the Japanese uh, design, and actually somebody jokingly say, "Hey, I have an idea. Let's just saw the let's just saw the buttstock off of it and attach it with a with a hinge." And that's exactly what they did. Both of those models, the Type Zero and the Type One, did not work. They only made a couple hundred, and therefore, if you find one, they are worth a lot of money. Uh, we have sold one in all the years, and actually, when it for, it was the Type One, uh, somebody brought it to me at a gun show, and I thought, "What a piece of crap." Um, and then he said, it's worth about 6,500. And I thought, there's just no way. 
Uh, we put it on our website. I think it lasted five minutes. Now let's talk about the rifle that we happen to have in front of us, and that is the Type 2. So again, we're going back to the Type 99, and we're going to uh, cut the rifle basically in half, and let me show you how this comes apart. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, compare the Type 2 paratrooper, um, which is, a, uh, of course, a Model 99 with a standard Model 99. Now, these were all came from the Nagoya factory, and they were just taken off the assembly line. There's no special serial block other than they were uh, pulled off in 1942. And you can see that all they did was they cut it. Um, they actually cut it right here. And because they cut it right here, they added these two pieces and they modified the uh, stock a little bit. You see a modification here. Uh, that's the only difference. So when you're looking at these, uh, making sure they're not fake, you would see that it's, it's cut. The two blocks, so they added these two blocks uh, for the attachment. And you can see these are serial numbered, but again, it's numbered after it's pulled off the factory floor. So you can see the serial number here will never match the serial numbers here. But these two will match each other, and this serial number will match any other serial numbers that are on the gun. And there's, it's serial numbered in a couple places, but this serial number will be matching to the gun. These two will match each other. Everything else is pretty much the same. One thing I noticed, I'm gonna compare two of the paratrooper rifles, but for some odd reason, they added uh, this little feature here. It makes it easier. Um, to lift it, but on all the 90, uh, Type 99s I checked, it doesn't have that feature. So uh, that's something that no one ever talked about before, but I noticed because I have two paratroopers, they both have this little cutout. So I'm not sure what value that adds, but it, it was added to the paratrooper. Now, another feature about the paratrooper that I need to mention, it does have the grooves for the dust cover. Uh, here you'll see I don't have one with a dust cover, but you'll see a picture of one that we have sold in the past. Um, these came with a dust cover, and this was the channel for the dust cover. But everything I watched on the internet and read said the first thing the paratroopers did was take the dust cover off and throw it away. Um, all the ones I've ever seen, the dust cover is missing. Also the monopod, there's a monopod that attaches here. Uh, and again, uh, often they were thrown away. They were very flimsy. And from what I could see, people trying them out using the monopod, uh, they weren't very helpful at all. Um, so the reason they removed these, uh, first of all, it, a little bit of weight, but most importantly, when you, when you, ran, when you run, and actually, uh, I think in Ian's video, he just, he bangs on it and you hear it rattle. And so when they were running um, and behind enemy lines, they're running and this dust cover is rattling, uh, the first thing you want to do is get rid of it. And again, some of the literature I read said they threw it away during basic training. First thing they did when they were issued the rifle, they got rid of the dust cover and many of them did away with the monopod. Uh, let's hold these up side by side. You can see that the front sight is calibrated uh, for distance, but also aircraft. Uh, it's calibrated for aircraft so that you can lead the aircraft. Um, so these are intact. This one, uh, they're missing. And that's just because I believe it's late war and they just didn't bother putting it on. They were rushing it out 1944, 1945, they were rushing them out. Um, I mentioned before the bolts stick straight up as opposed to the uh, K98, which has the bent bolt, which I, I kind of like the bent bolt a little bit better. Um, and you'll remember on Ian's video, this bolt actually unscrews. Uh, that design was, did not work and uh, was not a smart idea. Now, let me do a, uh, a correction of a previous video. Uh, what makes this one uh, even more valuable is the uh, intact mum. The chrysanthemum is the symbol of the empire, and this one has been ground off. Probably 98% of the guns that we get, they have the mum ground off. In fact, I have another paratrooper rifle. Let me switch these out. I just happen to have a second um, 
Type 2 paratrooper rifle. You can see that these are Type 2 because of this. We're going to take this off. The suspense is killing us all, but I'm going to take this apart uh, really soon. But I want to say about the mum. In a previous video, I said it wrong. I said the United States uh, asked that the chrysanthemum be removed. Somebody wisely corrected me, and of course, this uh, I checked, and this makes a lot more sense. It was actually the Japanese that removed the mum. It was a disgrace for them to surrender the emperor's property. So even though they surrendered themselves um, before they would uh, surrender their weapons, and that included their sidearms and their rifles, they would destroy the chrysanthemum. Sometimes I see them half missing or just a big X through them, uh, just defaced in some way. And I would imagine in the field, they just took a screwdriver and, and, and marked it all up because when they turned it in, they did not want the symbol of the emperor uh, um, showing that basically they were surrendering, surrendering his property to the enemy. So that is the reason that they destroyed the chrysanthemum. Uh, these are both type two paratroopers. Um, this one is obviously in much better condition. Okay, so this comes together unlike the two that Ian showed us. Uh, this has a little bolt that unscrews, very simply. And unlike, unlike the, uh, the bolt that they unscrewed, remember that bolt, uh, it was not attached in any way. This is captured, so it has, uh, when it comes out, it comes out, but it's still captured so that you can't accidentally, you know, pull this out and in the, in the field, uh, leave it behind. Uh, it stays captured, and then all you do is give it a pull, and it pulls right out. There is, there's not, it's not threaded like the uh, Type Zero. Um, it basically is held together with a bolt. If we look down inside here, you can see how the bolt seals it in place. Uh, great way to clean your gun, and then to store it. Basically, you know, this will fit. Uh, it actually fit in a little pouch that went around my waist and uh, would, would hang on my hip. So that was the uh, size of the paratrooper rifle. Uh, again, I like the U.S. design a lot better. Um, one of my favorite guns to shoot is the M1 carbine. And when you add the uh, paratrooper folding stock, um, I just love it. But that'll be a separate video. Let's put this back together so we're ready for battle. It just pops into place. Uh, let me pull the bolt out. There we go. And I got my gloves stuck in there. So you don't want to wear your gloves <laughs> when you go to battle. Uh, these are terrible gloves, by the way. But oh, pull this out, get my glove back. Good thing it wasn't my finger. Push it back in, put the bolt, and screw it down. Was that fun or what? And then we're ready to rock and roll. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I know I did. And of course, I can always learn more. So if you have comments uh, that you'd like to share, please, uh, please respond in the comment section. Keep it polite and we'd be happy to read it. And I often respond. So um, uh, also a special shout out to Ian McCullen from Forgotten Weapons for allowing us to borrow some of his uh, video. And uh, make sure you like and subscribe to our video channel because I have some more really interesting guns coming your way.